Hi, my name is Andrea Short. Um, I am um, on the board of directors for the Green Rock Autobahn Society, and I'm also a, a Wisconsin Master Naturalist. Uh, that's how I met Jane. Um, we took the Wisconsin Master Naturalist class together um, last summer, which was um, about a week straight of just uh, learning a lot about nature, getting out and seeing what we can do um, to for conservation, um, land management, and um, just in education. So that's part of what we're doing here today is just education, uh, spreading the knowledge of uh, birds that we, you know, we both are very much into birding and we love birds. I think um, the apps are really great for someone who is just starting out. I'm totally a pandemic birder. I didn't bird too much, but then I started walking around in the woods and I saw a barred owl and that was what started it. <laughs> I saw that owl and then I had to research what kind of owl it was, where I could find it again, what other types of owls, and then it just went from there. Um, and then I also started just, I have a little photography page on Facebook. Um, I do sell some crafts at the farmer's market um, the last couple years. I won't be there this summer for my business, um, but I do just love to share the photographs that I take. Um, they're all locally taken, mostly in my yard and just on the walking trails. And uh, Monterey Park is my other favorite place to bird. So, so yeah, that's a little bit about me, and I uh, will give it over to Jane. Hi. My name is Jane Anderson, and I got started birding when I was in college. I went to a liberal arts college, Luther College in Decorah, Iowa, where you had to take a variety of classes, and I took a field biology class uh, to California during our January term. I think I signed up for it mostly to go to California during <laughs> January. But uh, that's what opened my eyes to the world of birding. Uh, we got to see a California condor in the wild, which at that time they were down to, I believe, 18 individuals. Really remarkable. And so I continued to bird uh, pretty avidly using the good old Peterson Field Guide, which I think a lot of us probably learned to bird with. Uh, until four kids and a career, and then birding kind of took a hiatus for a while. But uh, as my kids got older and I had a little more time, I had a little more time to get out and bird too. And I'll talk a little bit in the talk about how I kind of stumbled into Merlin and eBird and learned more about it. So let's get started. Uh, if people have questions along the way, comments, please feel free. I'd like to keep it somewhat informal and a discussion. And uh, my disclaimer is I am not an expert uh, in Merlin and eBird, but I'm very enthusiastic about them. I'm learning. I learned a lot even putting this talk together. Amazing powerhouses of data and information. And so uh, I think there's a lot to learn. Some of you uh, may even have some pointers tonight. We have some excellent birders uh, in the audience who may be able to help out if I can't answer a question. So we're going to talk about two different apps tonight. Merlin helps identify birds by sight or sound. eBird is a database that, if you're interested, you can log your sightings and help contribute uh, to more knowledge about birds. These are both apps that are available through Cornell Lab. I'll show you the website in a minute. They're free um, and relatively easy to use. Uh, but I'd like to thank uh, Phil and the staff here at Hedberg Library uh, for allowing us to present tonight. Uh, Green Rock Audubon and Rock County Conservationists, uh, along with Andrea and her, I think I spelled that wrong, birds and, okay. sorry about that. Uh, and uh, the Wisconsin Master Naturalist Program. And just a word about that for any of you who might be interested. This is the 11th year of the Wisconsin Master Naturalist Program. Some of you may be familiar with the concept through Master Gardener, through Rotary Garden, where you get additional training and then you volunteer back hours. So uh, UW Extension started this 11 years ago. Um, it's 40 hours of classroom and field training. And at different sites, they do it in different ways. Some it's uh, the class we took last year at Wealthy Environmental Center at Big Hill was a uh, full week. It was like going to grown-up camp. It was wonderful. So every day we spent eight hours doing this. Uh, other sites may do two weekends a month, something like that. Um, once you complete the 40 hours of training, uh, then you're encouraged to volunteer back 40 hours a year plus take eight hours of additional training so that you stay current. 
The three areas that you can serve in are community education, similar to our talk tonight, citizen science. If you contribute your sightings through eBird, you are contributing to citizen science. And stewardship, for example, if you wanted to go to the Green Rock Audubon sites and pull garlic mustard or help out in that way to help improve a site. Uh, this year, these are the training sites that uh, are here in Wisconsin. So you can see they're located throughout the state. Uh, when I was deciding to participate last year, I was kind of interested in going further afield, maybe up to Bayfield. But I'm really grateful I stayed in the area because I met so many amazing people. And the age range was from people in their 20s to people in their 70s. Uh, all backgrounds, all variety of experience. Uh, and I learned so much uh, from the people in the class with me and really discovered a lot of amazing places right here in Rock County, right here in our own backyard. All right, so the apps that we're using tonight are from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology from Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. This is the website that you can start with, but if you simply Google Cornell Labs or eBird, uh, it'll be easy to find. So again, we're looking at two apps, uh, Merlin to start with, that helps you identify the bird, and then eBird can help you record and keep track of your sightings, as well as contribute to citizen science. Why do we watch birds? Why do you watch birds? It's fun. <laughs> because? They're all so different. Amazing colors and sounds and habitats and behaviors, for sure. Why else do we bird? They're beautiful, aren't they? <laughs> Amazing. Anybody else? They sing. They sing uh, the beautiful songs. Yeah. I love the sounds. It's relaxing. Absolutely. Uh, it can be a really rewarding hobby. They're very entertaining. They're always doing something that's interesting. That you've never seen. And sometimes we understand why they're doing what they're doing, and sometimes they it doesn't. Interact. Right, so I, I think the number one reason people would say is it's enjoyable to watch birds. Birds are everywhere. It's very unusual to spend any amount of time outside without seeing a bird or hearing a bird, almost regardless of the habitat you're in, whether you're urban or rural, uh, whatever continent practically, even Antarctica. I've got somebody here who's seen, were you in Antarctica when you saw your penguins? Uh, so birds are everywhere. We can see birds so much more easily than mammals, than amphibians, than reptiles. And while it's wonderful to study all of those, birds just lend themselves to making it very easy. Uh, for a lot of us, we like to challenge ourselves. We like to see if we can identify this bird by sight or by sound. Uh, some people keep a life list. They like to keep track of how many birds they've seen. In fact, some people get pretty competitive with their life lists and will go literally to the ends of the earth to see a rare bird. Uh, I think for some of us, we enjoy the community. Uh, it's estimated right now that about one third of Americans, about one million Americans participate in birding in some way, feeding birds, watching birds, listening to birds. Uh, this is a survey from 2022 from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. 35% of the nation's population identify as participating in birding in some way. This is more than double the figure from 2016. So what happened between 2016 and 2022, right? How many of you got more into birding as a result of time spent outside during the pandemic? Yeah, I think for a lot of people that was a way that they discovered birding and that's backed up by the number of bird books and binoculars and bird feeders that sold and sold out during the pandemic as people were spending more time right in their own backyards or right in their own neighborhoods. Some people get into birding for conservation or advocacy to protect the birds. And we have good data that says that birding provides health benefits. There are a number of studies that point to not only time in nature, but specifically time spent observing birds or listening to bird songs that was associated with time lasting improvements, meaning not just the time spent birding, but hours and days later down the road. These improvements were evident not only for healthy people, but also for those with a diagnosis of depression. 
Um, I am a family physician, and one of the things I routinely recommend for good health, along with healthy diet and regular exercise, is time in nature. You don't have to go to the mountains. You don't have to go to the ocean. You can sit on your back porch and feel the breeze and see the sun and listen to the birds, and that will make an improvement in your mental health. So let's start with a quiz. We're going we're gonna to work on identifying birds tonight using these apps, but let's start just with what we know. Is this a Wisconsin bird? Oh, yes, yes, it's our state bird. <laughs> it is the Wisconsin state bird, uh, selected uh, in 1949 to be the state bird. So that is an American robin. Are robins here all year long? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh-oh, I hear a no and I hear a yes. Neil, maybe you can help answer that question. In the winter, they hide out in the woods. So they are around in the winter. We just don't see the same numbers, right? And they're not eating quite the same food because there aren't worms out on the sidewalks after the rain in the wintertime, right? And it's hard to pull a worm out of frozen ground. Right. So if we look at the distribution of robins, this is the year-round distribution. So here in Wisconsin, they are here, but they're harder to find. Usually you can find them near a source of water. Uh, up at the UW Arboretum, that was the first time near a little spring that runs year-round that I saw a robin in the winter. But oftentimes we think of robins as the first sign of spring, right? We think that they migrate away and then come back. So that is a Wisconsin bird. That's a bird that's actually here year-round. Here are some other birds that we can see year-round here in Wisconsin. Who can identify this one? Crow, Cardinal, Cardinal. Cardinal. Chickadees. Chickadees. The, this is what gives it away right there. Red-tailed hawk. So these are birds that are here year-round. Uh, we're familiar with the chickadee and cardinal because those are birds that often come to our feeders in the wintertime, so we can see them right outside our, our windows. Is this a Wisconsin bird? Yes, Rufus hummingbird. Ruby-throated hummingbird, right. So this is a Wisconsin bird, but is it here year-round? No. Why? It eats insects and nectar from flowers. And what don't we have much of in the wintertime in Wisconsin, right? Insects and flowers. <laughs> right. So ruby-throated hummingbirds are in the eastern part of the United States in the summertime, but migrate down to Central America during the wintertime. These are some other birds that we see in the summer, right? Just in the last week and a half, I've seen an awful lot of this bird. Baltimore Oriole, House Wren. Eastern meadowlark, and we see these right out back of the library. Pelicans, right. Is this a Wisconsin bird? Sometimes. What is, what is this bird? A snowy owl. These birds breed up in the Arctic, but they come down just about as far as Janesville, Wisconsin, sometimes even further depending on if they have a big population. This app that we're working on tonight, Merlin, is smart. Knowing your location and knowing the time of year, it can help you know what birds you're seeing. So if you see a big white bird, is it a pelican or is it a snowy owl? Well, depending on the time of year and the location, what the bird's doing, Merlin will help you identify that. These are some other winter birds. Does anybody know this one? A shrike. And a junco, very good. So juncos are around in the summer too, again, just not as much. We tend to think of them as winter birds. Is this a Wisconsin bird? That is the American flamingo. Where do we expect to see flamingos? Florida. But guess what? This is Lake Michigan. Last summer, flamingo sighting on Lake Michigan, Wisconsin, September 24th, 2023. There were adults and chicks. The gray bird is actually a chick. They have to eat the shrimp to get the pink color for their feathers. So amazingly, we had flamingos in Wisconsin. You can bet there were a lot of those competitive birders who want that bird for their <laughs> life list over on the Michigan shore, right? Is this a Wisconsin bird? But it was last summer. Last summer was an amazing summer for these uh, rare sightings. So this was in Green Bay in July last summer. Did anybody go see the flamingos or the spoonbill? These are some others, and they're called accidental or vagrant birds. Who knows what this is? 
Who's seen Olympkin? Yeah, did you see it in? in no, I saw it in Utah. OK, all right. Where did you see your Olympkin? Uh, the last one I saw was in Edgerton. Edgerton, OK. So that is an unusual bird. This is a flame tanager, is that right? Flame colored tanager. So they're Arizona birds, so it's unusual for them to be here. Why do, why do these birds end up in Wisconsin? They didn't like the heat. <laughs> <laughs> Come up for a vacation. Uh, probably weather patterns. Probably has to do with being blown off course. Uh, as you're all aware, we have more severe weather and odd weather at times. And so some of these birds probably get blown off course. Some of them may be uh, juvenile birds that kind of haven't got migration quite down yet, or they got in with another flock somehow. So climate change could have an impact on where Absolutely. They go. Absolutely. And where their food sources are, and what's available, yeah. and where their nesting sites are. Yeah, climate change is very important for migratory birds. So first one, uh, first app that we're going to learn about tonight is Merlin. And I don't know if some of you have used it before, had a chance to put it on your phone. Uh, but it is a quick identification guide for all levels of birders. Um, by answering a few simple questions, the size, the color, and behavior of the bird, as well as your location and the date. So those five bits of information remarkably can help identify almost any bird. Merlin comes with a bird pack so that you, you can identify that you're in the Midwest, for example. That will help it be more accurate. So you don't get the whole world of birds all at once. That's uh, an awful lot of birds to try to narrow down. But it will tell you based on uh, your location. So if you haven't already, we can help you afterward make sure that you have the appropriate bird pack. What's cool is if you're traveling, you can adjust your bird pack. So if you go to California, you're west of the Rocky Mountains, you're going to see some different birds. So you simply upload the local bird pack, and it'll help you with that. Just do it before you go out birding. <laughs> I've, gone out, I've gone out before and said, oh, I forgot to update the bird pack, like when I was traveling down in like South Carolina. But it's, it's, really, it's a really useful feature. It's very cool how you can zero in on different locations where you're at. Right. I've heard this comment over and over regarding Merlin that it is a game changer when it comes to birding. Not that this isn't a wonderful field guide, but uh, this just offers so much more in the palm of your hand instantaneously. Um, my husband got into birding during the pandemic because the spring of 2020 there was no baseball. <laughs> so we would go out. He, he was kind of a casual birder before that. He would go along with me reluctantly. But when he started using this, he said it's like walking through O'Hare Airport where you'd hear all these languages, but you didn't know what they were speaking. And this is like having the interpreter when you listen to the sound portion of Merlin to identify birds by sound. And he became a very enthusiastic birder after that because it just opened the doors for him. Uh, and again, if you look at Cornell data, the use of this app just exploded during the pandemic lockdown. While we never won a pandemic, uh, there were silver linings like this. All right. So we're going to watch a short video. This is from Cornell Labs. I didn't feel like I could duplicate it in my talk as well as they can here. And if you go to the Cornell website, you can watch all of these. There will be a lot of data tonight. Don't get overwhelmed. This is simply to introduce you, give you a sense of uh, what these apps can do, what you can do with these apps. So don't worry if you don't keep up with everything it's saying or if it's a little bit uh, confusing at times. Merlin is your bird ID wizard. Get help identifying the birds you see in here. To identify who's singing, tap Sound ID. Next, tap Record. And listen in with Merlin. Merlin gives you a list of who's singing in real time. When you finish recording your mystery bird, tap stop. Now it's time to compare what you recorded with Merlin's best matches. Let's listen to Merlin's first choice, a swamp sparrow.
Now let's compare this recording to the one you made. This sounds exactly like what you recorded. When you are confident, scroll down and tap This Is My Bird. Celebrate your newfound bird and save it to your life list by answering a few more questions about your observation. Now that you're on a roll, find more birds near you with the Explore feature. The best way to find more birds is to explore a list of species you are most likely to see where you are. Tap the filter button, choose filter by likely birds, and sort by most likely to see a list of birds you're likely to see where you are. See more about a species by tapping on the bird. You can browse photos, hear sounds, and see range maps. Merlin has many ways to help you name that bird, including photo ID. Merlin uses the same machine learning tools it uses to identify sounds, to identify species in a photo. I saw a bird the other day that I couldn't identify. Let's get Merlin's help. Here's a photo of my mystery bird. Zoom until the bird fills the box and then tap next. Now we'll answer as many questions as we can about the photo. Tap Identify to see a list of possibilities. Merlin's first choice looks like a great fit, but let's look at a few more just to be sure. No, the yellow rum warbler is a perfect fit. Merlin is your personalized field guide, helping you put names to the birds you see and hear anywhere in the world. We're gonna save our practice for afterwards, but I did wanna ask how many people here have used Merlin before? So at least half of you. The amazing thing is you can sit on your back porch. You can go uh, visit someone in a nursing home and sit out in the back of the nursing home. Uh, any ability can do this. So you don't have to be able to go deep into the woods. You can listen to the birds in your own backyard, the birds that come to your feeder. And in fact, there's a project feeder watch where you can contribute by documenting the birds you're seeing just in your own backyard without ever leaving your house. Oh, we are gonna practice. We're gonna practice with these birds. This is one of your photos, right? It is, yeah. Uh, and you wanna tell them a little bit about these two birds? Um, those are the um, marling eagles. Um, they were, I think that was, this was before their nest fell, obviously. They, this was the pair of eagles that the, had the nest and it fell when the baby was in the nest. They were on the Rock River, right where the river takes a bend at marling lumber. So yeah. a lot of people over the last couple of years have observed this pair raising chicks. So if you have Merlin, uh, let's try it once. Can you open up your Merlin? And we'll use step-by-step -step ID. So Janesville, Wisconsin, it's okay to use today's date even though this picture was taken at a different time. So we select the date for today. And the next thing it asks is the size of your bird. Have some of you gotten there? Okay. So this bird, uh, sometimes it's a little hard to tell if you don't have a scale, but the best you can, I'm gonna suggest that this one is the size of a goose. So you can select goose and hit next. What colors would you say that bird is, based on the choices that are given here? So if you put in brown and white, I debated whether to put yellow. You see a lot of yellow there, that's all beak. I honestly didn't know if beak counted as part of the color that you put. So I tried first with brown and white. I wanted to use this as an example, because we get two different answers depending. <laughs> And then it says, was the bird, and it gives you of choices, eating at a feeder, swimming on the ground, in trees or bushes, on a fence or wire, or soaring. In this case, these birds are in trees or bushes. So we hit next. And the first bird that popped up when I practiced this is actually a red-tailed hawk. 
The second choice down is a bald eagle. Most of us know this bird. We know it's a bald eagle. My first one was osprey. Yeah, uh -huh. Interesting. So I maybe have a later or earlier version. So I went, I hit my back button and went back, and I did put yellow as a color too. Although, do you know, do you count the beak? But when I put that in, bald eagle was the first one that came up. I put yellow in. I put brown, white, and yellow, and I got the osprey. And you got the osprey. So if you scroll up, what's the second suggestion it makes? Juvenile bald eagle. Okay. So one thing to know about Merlin, it is not perfect for, for uh, the ID or photos or sound. It's really good. It's really amazing. However, it's not perfect, so you have to use a little common sense or be a little bit skeptical sometimes, too. In fact, I was watching a Zoom meeting at Cornell Labs where they had a competition between Merlin and two birders. And Merlin was right 60% of the time, and the two birders were right 90% of the time. So the, the people at this point still beat the machine learning. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that. Eagle, OK. So and again, people may put different colors, or they may choose to identify the beak color or not. But the idea is it'll give you a shorter list than opening this book and saying, oh my gosh, I'm not even sure where to start. All right, so that's Merlin. And I hope if you take nothing else away from this talk tonight that at least you feel comfortable loading Merlin, using it to identify birds. <laughs> I'm hearing an eagle. Um, however, I'm hoping that as you get more comfortable using Merlin and hopefully more interested in birding, that you would be willing to start to contribute some of your sightings to the second app called eBird. And you can do that just for your own use. You can keep it anonymous. You can keep your locations anonymous. And you can do it just so you have a life list. And it really is amazing the data that it stores and how you can slice it and dice it. So you can tell what birds you saw on what date, what locations, how many different species you've seen, et cetera. But if you're willing to share that, that is what makes this such a powerful tool is by the time literally millions of people around the globe are submitting sightings, even if it's one bird in your backyard, by the time you multiply that over millions of people, this becomes an amazing database that's allowed scientists to do some remarkable things. So this first short video is simply an introduction to kind of the power of eBird. Again, I don't expect you to remember every detail, but I just think it's really impressive. If we go ahead with that, do you need me to push? What if there were a way to take all of these observations, yours, ours, everyone's, and put them all in one place? If we could do this, we would fundamentally transform not just birding, but science and conservation. From this idea emerged eBird. Put simply, eBird is a way for anyone around the world to store their birding observations, their photos, their sound recordings, and make them available to educators, scientists, and birders. It's incredibly easy to use, and it's incredibly powerful. All you do is let us know where you went birding, when, how far you traveled, and what you saw. It's powerful because hundreds of thousands of people all around the world are doing it, and it's growing. eBird already safeguards half a billion sightings, information that allows all of us to understand the movements and needs of birds at global scales. eBird maintains your lists for you and shares them with other birders from around the world. By sharing, it's now possible for anyone, anywhere, to find your target birds and the best birding hotspots any time of the year. Before eBird, there was no way to comprehensively understand population level movements of many species. By combining your sightings with remote sensed habitat data from NASA, we're able to generate species distribution models that provide an unparalleled view of where and when birds are in the landscape. 
Scientists and students all over the world are now able to use eBird datasets for their research at a variety of spatial scales. These observations help inform better conservation strategies, opening the door to the future of bird conservation. And this is just the beginning. With the help of millions of people who come to eBird each year, we are creating a free, open access system that is easy to use, fun, and rewarding. Rewarding for birders, for scientists, for conservationists, and ultimately, the birds themselves. Go to eBird.org or download eBird Mobile to get started, all for free. By joining eBird, you're joining a global team of people that share your passion for birds. Be a part of it. If any of you are educators or have educators in your family, there are wonderful resources too for teachers, for professors to use. Right. And again, I realize this is a lot of information, but just to give you a sense, and all of this is available if you go to the Cornell site and you can watch again at your convenience. One more video. Uh, this is how you would submit a sighting. So you've seen a bird in your backyard, you're ready to submit this as an introduction to how to do that. First install the app. You'll need to download a pack of information on what birds are expected in your region. Bird packs let you get a precise list of birds for your area, regardless of your internet connection. The app will suggest the best pack based on where you are, and you can download other packs through settings at any time. Now you're ready to start birding. Typically, you'll be entering a checklist in real time, so the app knows the date and time you're starting. I want to record my track, so I'll leave that on. Tracking is a great feature that allows eBird to fill in where you're birding, how far you travel, and how long you're birding for. It keeps track so you don't have to. All right, you're all set. Now click Start Checklist. When you start a checklist, eBird uses your current GPS location and your bird packs to provide a list of expected species that are likely to be in that area at that time of year. You'll fill in this checklist as you go. Once you've found a bird you know, by sight or sound, the fastest way to add it is to type right here in the quick entry bar. Let's start with two mallards out on the pond. Type the number of birds, two, and the species, mallard. Then select the species from the checklist, and you're all set. It's that easy. Let's enter a few more sightings the same way. There's five Canada geese foraging in the grass. Sounds like there's a red-tailed hawk calling nearby. And there's an osprey eating a fish. And a great blue heron flying overhead. You can see all the birds you've already tallied by switching to the checked view. This is particularly helpful for adding more sightings to a species. For example, you see three more mallards. Tap the number three times and you're all set. You'll notice some birds have these icons next to their names. These show whether a bird is infrequently reported or unreported for that region and time of year. By tapping a species name, you can make changes to your tally or add comments about the bird's field marks, its behavior, the habitat you saw it in, or anything else you find interesting. This is especially important for those rare and unusual sightings. You can see where you've been by clicking here to review your track. When you're finished birding, tap Stop. If you have an active track, eBird will ask you if you're done birding. Tap Stop Track to confirm. Now it's time to review your checklist. The first thing you'll need to do is add your location. It's important to choose a location that accurately represents where you were birding. You can either choose an appropriate existing location or create a new location by tapping on the map. In this case, you were birding at Sapsucker Woods, so choose that location. Next is info about your birding outing. This is what makes eBird tracking great. Tracking has already defined your checklist type based on whether you are moving or stationary. Tracking also fills in the duration and distance traveled. You can change your checklist type and edit the other fields if you need to. Before you can submit, eBird asks if you're submitting a complete checklist of the birds you were able to identify. 
Complete checklists are eBird's way of knowing you've identified and reported all of the birds you saw or heard to the best of your ability. It's not possible to detect every single bird. Nobody can do that. As long as you've listed all of the species you could identify, then check yes. You can also enter comments about your birding experience. You can document the weather, other animals you saw, or any other fun memories. Last, but not least, you can review the species you reported. When you're ready, click Submit. Congratulations, you're an eBirder. You're now part of the largest birding community in the world. And you can share the list. So if you're out with a group, one of you can keep the list and share with everybody else so you don't all have to enter the same data uh, over and over. All right. So here's my eBird story. Uh, I live on the east side of Janesville, and in the fall of 2015, I saw a pair of birds, they were further away, they weren't quite that close, that looked like this. And so I get out my field guide, and I look through here, and I find a bird that I said, well, that kind of looks like a Mississippi kite. But boy, was it out of its territory. A Mississippi kite is a southern bird, Florida, Texas. So I really wasn't sure what I'd seen. I didn't think too much about it. But the next spring, I went on a field trip to Who's Woods Raptor Rehabilitator uh, here in Rock County. And there was one of those birds at Who's Woods. And so Diane Muller, uh, who is the director there, I said, tell me more about that. Well, her bird, her Mississippi kite, was found down as a chick in the fall of 2015. They didn't know if it had fledged in Illinois where there was a record in Rockford of Mississippi kites nesting, and then flown to Wisconsin, or whether it had fledged in Wisconsin. So they knew, and it had uh, West Nile virus and had issues with balance, and so it wasn't able to be released, it wasn't able to fly. So she said, well, if you see that bird again, give me a call. So this is uh, Who's Woods? Uh, north of town. She's got a variety of different birds that have been injured and are now used for education birds. She rehabilitates uh, birds of prey, uh, releases them whenever she can. So now it's spring of 2016, and I see this bird again. And I look it up. Still looks like the Mississippi kite I saw in the fall. So I call Diane from Who's Woods, and she gets a hold of the DNR, and the DNR comes and follows the bird and finds that. So that is the first documented Mississippi kite chick in Janesville, Wisconsin in 2016. So we made the breeding bird atlas as the first documented site. So this would be an example of climate change because these birds didn't used to be able to find habitat and feed here. So those birds now since have come far enough north that they're in Illinois and they're in Wisconsin. So this is the chick as he was fledging. He's got his little feathers fledged out there. I learned about eBird with this because I didn't know a lot about eBird at the time. I thought it was some private database that I entered my data and the data went straight to New York and nobody else knew about it. I didn't understand the sharing part. So I put all kinds of details in eBird, where it was that there was a pair, that there was a chick, and literally 65 minutes later, my doorbell rang. Oh my God. Why do you think my doorbell rang? Because part of eBird is a rare bird alert. I didn't know that, and I put all the location and I put all the data, and so three people from Milwaukee jumped in a car and drove over here as fast as they could, and they were standing at my front door, and they said, where's the bird? And at the same time, I was getting an urgent notification on eBird saying, take the location off. Don't put the location of something this rare because lots of people will come to see it. So they said, you can put Rock County or Janesville or something like that, but don't put the specific location. <laughs> So I learned a lot about eBird in one day because of that. <laughs> Have you seen them since? Uh, the following year, and then I haven't since, although I think they're more on the north side of town now. The pair that showed up briefly last year also. Hi. I heard they're, they're never confirmed too. to be breeding. Yeah. I heard they're here this year too, by the way. Yeah, so, uh, and they were in a urban 
busy yard, not far from an elementary school, not far from a busy road, lots of noise, pretty amazing. Um, but do you know why this is so cool? Because ordinary amateur citizens and bird watchers can make significant contributions to science and to conservation. You can do this. Any of us can do this just by looking out in your backyard, just by noticing what you see when you're out walking around and making that entry in eBird. So I, I think this is amazing. Ornithology is still one of the fields where amateurs can make a big difference and a big contribution. So I'll show you a little bit of what my account looks like. Um, so I just started eBird in about 2016. I'd been birding a lot before that, and I didn't enter past sightings. But when you set up your eBird and go on, the, the phone is more limited in what you can see. I suggest you go to your computer if you're wanting to look at all of your stats. They will put up beautiful bird pictures. This isn't my picture. This isn't a bird that I saw. But these are my stats here. And so in the state of Wisconsin since 2016, when I started, I've seen 136 species. I've entered photos for some of them. They'll tell you how many days in a row you submitted a checklist. They try to encourage you to make it a habit. So you have a, you know, if any of you do Duolingo, you know how they, it encourages you to keep going on your streak. So kind of like that. Um, checklists that have been completed and any audio. I have never submitted audio. I haven't figured out that part of it yet. But there are people who actually use microphones plugged into their phone to get really good quality sound and submit. So again, this is what you'll have stats similar that show you as you start to see more and more species and submit more checklists. You can make it for Wisconsin. You can make it for bigger areas, the lower 48 states, things like this. I think it, it uh, defaults to, to the state that you're in. And again, there's so much information that you can look at in different ways. So this is a list of my 136 species. On my computer, I can scroll down and when they were seen and where they were seen. So it's a really nice way next year to say, now, what time of the year was it that that bird came back to my backyard? You can look in here, and it's a good reminder of all of that. Uh, so this I adjusted from Wisconsin to the lower 48. So my list went from 136 to 155, because I also um, do some birding in Iowa or other states. As you're traveling, you certainly, uh, I encourage you to continue to bird when you're traveling. And the checklists I've submitted. So you also can go and say, well, let's see. Uh, what did I see when I was at Hedberg Library on May 11th? So this was Saturday was Global uh, World Migratory Bird Day. So I came to the library. I got out of my car. I walked and <laughs> looked over the river and stopped here. And this is what I saw on Saturday when I was at the library. So. What makes a house sparrow different than the rest of these other birds? Non it's non-native, right? So that means non-native, that little asterisk there. They still count. It still counts to see them, but that helps identify that for you. Another thing that's on eBird, you, if there's a species you want to see, I've never seen a black crowned night heron, and I really want to see one, you can look for where that bird has been seen recently. So if you're very determined to see that bird, you can find out if it's been seen in your area, uh, what day, what time of day, you can get that kind of information. Um, what I like this for especially is this thing called hotspots. So a hotspot is an area that someone has essentially kind of nominated as a, an area where a lot of birders go or where a lot of birds are seen. It helps you uh, have, a, if you're traveling, for example, you can look for hotspots to know where there's a good place to go birding locally. Now, interestingly, hotspots you'll see tend to be congregated around urban areas. Is that because all the birds live in urban areas? No. <laughs> so why do the hotspots tend to occur? So here, here's the Midwest. Here's Lake Michigan. So why are the hotspots in Chicago and Madison and Milwaukee and Iowa City and Des Moines? Right. So it's not that there aren't birds out here. Uh, you know, this is the more species sighted, the redder it gets. So there might be really good birding in areas. This might be a place for you to go and spend some time birding and eventually create a hot spot. So we can zoom in. This is now Wisconsin. Here's the Mississippi River and Lake Michigan. And here's Janesville. So you can see we've got some hot spots there. And if we zoom in a little more, uh, there's this really nice birding corridor 
down through here. And one of my projects as part of Wisconsin Master Naturalist is I hope to keep birding those and reach out to like the Visitor and Convention Bureau for ecotourism so that Janesville has some really nice hot spots. If people are coming to town, they'll have a place where they know to go bird. Uh, probably the most species listed in the area, though, is out at uh, the Arboretum. And again, it's not that there aren't birds all along here. It's just there has not been a hot spot made. You could submit a list wherever you are, whether you're near a hot spot or not, and it'll show the area where you are. So if you click on a hot spot, so again, let's say you're traveling, you want to find a place to go bird, you can zoom in where you're going, you can find a hot spot, click on it, it'll tell you what's been seen, you can look at the checklists. So for example, uh, there's a checklist at Monterey Park, so you can see what was seen on May 11th. If you put your name in and you want it seen, it can be shown, you can also list yourself as anonymous or by initials if you don't want your name out there. And this is me, our guest Josh is here tonight. His is in blue, if you click on his, you can see more about him, including his picture of the Limpkin. Very cool. Uh, I apparently didn't know that, or for some reason didn't set it up that way. So if you were to click on my name, it doesn't go anywhere. So again, if you'd prefer to remain anonymous, you can keep it that way. Um, you can see all kinds of statistics for the month, or the year, or the location, or the birder. It's, it's really fascinating how you can really drill down. So here in the state of Wisconsin, there have been almost 2 million checklists. There are 34,000 people on eBird from the state of Wisconsin. And again, not surprising, it's the more populated counties that are submitting the most lists. But we could change that. We could make Janesville one of those in the top 10. And each month on email, eBird will send you an update of your own stats so you can see how you're doing. In April of 2024, there were more than 2 million checklists submitted throughout the world. Again, an amazing tool. I wanted to mention one more. Uh, uh, it's not an app. One more uh, tool that's out there called BirdCast. How many of you know about BirdCast? So BirdCast uh, is an amazing way of the same way that they track weather using radar, they can track birds and bird migration. This started in 2018. It's machine learning. It's huge data sets. This was last Saturday night. This shows the migration of birds in nearly real time. So you can look that day and see what's predicted that night. After a big night of migration, you can go out the next morning and expect to see some new birds in, especially if it's kind of rainy the next day. Those birds are going to sit down and rest a little bit. So this can help predict when you're going to see more birds. But even more importantly for the birds, what do you think this can help us do to help protect birds? If we know it's migration time, what are some things we can do? Turn out the lights. Right, so this was an alert from Saturday night, last Saturday night. It says more than uh, 19,000 birds per area that night. So they put out a warning alert asking people to turn lights off. And so this way, it can be a very refined tool. We know birds are migrating through this city this night. So we can ask businesses and buildings to turn the lights off. Why do we do that? Why is it important to turn lights off during migration? Birds didn't evolve with electric lights. Birds are attracted to the light, or they get confused by the light. And so unfortunately, they tend to fly into them. Songbirds migrate at the same level as skyscrapers. So last year, uh, I actually was lucky enough to take a trip to the Field Museum and see how they preserve bird specimens. Very shortly after that, um, the Field Museum, along with Audubon down there, has a program where they go around to the big buildings in Chicago during migration time and pick up the dead birds so that they can, and injured birds, and try to rehabilitate the injured birds. So they actually are keeping track of what birds hit, when they hit. Last October, 
uh, because of the weather pattern, birds were flying even lower than normal. There were nearly 1,000 birds that were killed at the convention center in downtown Chicago, the McCormick Center. This is the Field Museum in Chicago, and these are all the birds from one, one night, one building. So that's why it's really important uh, to turn lights out at night. We encourage you to keep lights on for safety if you need them at your house, but if you don't need big, huge yard lights, if you don't need lights that shine up, please have the more conservative lights that direct down. I wanted to end the talk tonight by just talking about a couple of simple things that we all can do to help protect our birds. This comes from Cornell Labs. So first thing related to those windows is try to prevent bird strikes. Bird strike is a major cause of bird mortality in our houses, in our businesses. So there are different uh, treatments that you can put on your windows so that the birds see the windows. When a bird is flying and it gets, sees the reflection of the window, it doesn't understand glass. It doesn't understand that it's not seeing a reflection of clouds or a reflection of trees. So it'll fly full speed into a window and end up dying. And even if they're stunned and seem to recover, they often go off to die later. A bird strike is almost always fatal. Uh, Madison in 2020 uh, enacted a new city ordinance that now any new construction going up and downtown has bird friendly windows because there's also technology building glass, new glass, new construction to make those windows so that birds can see them. Uh, cats are also a major source of bird mortality. Your cat's going to be healthier if it's kept indoors, and it's certainly safer for the birds. So they recommend building catios, you know, uh, screen porches for cats, or taking a cat out on a leash or in a carrier, but not letting a cat roam. Uh, here in Janesville, we are a bird city. Part of the way we got that uh, designation of a bird city, Neil, I think you were responsible for a lot of that, was we have a cat leash law. You cannot let your cat run at large in Janesville. I'm sure all of us know neighbors who still do, right? Uh, but theoretically, a cat has to be under your control on your property. Reduce lawn and plant natives. Uh, Dave Bendlin from Rock County Conservation has a couple of uh, plants for a pollinator uh, that uh, we'll have at the end of the talk tonight. But if you can reduce the amount of lawn and add more variety of pollinators and native plants, that provides feed for the birds. So if we have millions and millions of acres of urban land that looks like this, and, million and millions of acres of farmland that looks like this, this is what it looks like to a bird. There is, there is not much to eat in that kind of environment. If you can plant native plants, if you can leave some brush piles, you will have more food for birds, more cover for birds, you'll have more birds. You won't have to go as far to bird. You can bird right in your own backyard. Um, if you Google in Wisconsin native plants, you'll find nurseries, you'll find plant sales. Avoiding pesticides and herbicides or using very targeted treatment. Rather than spraying the whole lawn, spray the few areas or dig by hand. Or better yet, get rid of the grass uh, and plant a native. A single pair of breeding chickadees needs about 7,500 caterpillars to rear one clutch of young. So you can imagine if it is a lawn sprayed, no insects, no plants, these birds are going to have to work awfully hard to get enough food to raise one nest of young. Chickadees might be able to eat seed out of your feeder, but their babies can't. Their babies rely on insects for protein. Uh, additional things uh, support bird-friendly coffee, reduce the amount of plastic. All our plastic ends up in the environment somewhere. A lot of it does. So if you can reduce your plastic and watch birds and share what you see through things like Project Feeder Watch in your own backyard, the Christmas Bird Count, which takes place here in Janesville. Uh, World Migratory Bird Day was just on Saturday, submitting some sightings for that. Uh, one final thing I wanted to let you know about. Yes, question. Uh, Bird Friendly Coffee is, this is the website that you want to check the QR code for over here. Uh, it's grown uh, in areas where they don't use as many herbicides, pesticide, uh, shade grown coffee, where they use friendlier practices. So rather than clear cut a forest to plant coffee, they work within the native environment. And 
And I think the major grocery stores carry that coffee. Yeah. Yeah. One uh, last place that I wanted to let you know about, uh, Sand Bluff Bird Observatory is about 35 minutes from here, just over the border into Illinois. They do bird banding, and if you want to see birds up close, if you want to see birds literally in the hand, uh, you can go and watch. You don't have to do anything. You can just sit and observe. If it's something that you want to volunteer for, they're always accepting volunteers, but they use mist nets, fine nets, that birds fly into. They're not injured. They're taken carefully out of the net, weighed, measured, a small band, small aluminum band is put on their leg. Uh, a lot of information is gained this way. Bird banding's been going on in this country for about 100 years. We learn about how long birds live, where they migrate before we had this bird cast. This was how we knew where birds went when they went over the horizon in the fall. Uh, amazing opportunity to really be able to see these birds up close. So I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, if anybody's watching on cable TV, thank you for watching. And I hope you take the opportunity to go birding wherever you are. Happy birding.